When you dare to share, you break the silence. When you dare to share, you speak your truth. When you dare to share, you use the full strength of your voice. When you dare to share, it brings opportunity to own your story. So tell it, be heard, and at the same time, your sharing is someone else's learning, inspiration, motivation, empowerment, and hope. There's always an element to each of our stories that remains a secret. For some, we feel it's a dirty little secret. Dare to share your untold story exposes these secrets in a welcoming and positive way. I encourage each of you out there to dare yourself to share what is yours to tell. When we dare, it is the courage to do something really important. Let this be a vow to each and every single one of us that we take risk, we brave, confront, and face what is, while inspiring and empowering all communities. So let's break that silence and tap into mental beauty. This is Salima Jadavji, your podcast host, a practicing social worker, and your mental wellness connoisseur. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast, episode number 53, Growing Up With No Voice and Feeling the Grief and Pain That Led Her to Find Her Voice. To all my fellow listeners, before we get started, I'm just dropping in a note to give you a heads up that this podcast might be emotionally triggering for you. We do invite guests onto the show who share openly about extremely difficult life moments with exposure and impact of what the struggles have been like. The intensity of each episode could have a variable impact on your emotional and mental well-being based on your own personal story. If at any point the topic becomes uncomfortable or upsetting to you in any way, please do not pressure yourself to listen. Instead, be kind to yourself, do some self-care, and perhaps give another episode a try. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our courageous and daring guest, Belinda Daye. Belinda is a Congolese African who moved to Canada in 2004. Since she was 10 years old, she has been a striving athlete and has been involved in various sports opportunities. Belinda completed five years as a varsity basketball player and received her Bachelor of Commerce and Human Resources with a minor in psychology. Her academic endeavors continued as she also received her master's degree in industrial organizational psychology, where she gained social justice experience supporting a nonprofit organization called Hey Black Girl. Belinda is currently pursuing a career as a human resources professional. Belinda is a person of purpose that utilizes her values and optimism to navigate life's challenges to the best of her abilities. As a natural born leader, she introduces herself to the world as a storyteller through her strong communication style. In addition, she has a passion for supporting and exploring the growth and development of people's potential. In addition to being career driven, Belinda enjoys reading, traveling, and trying new things, as well as spending time with her family and friends. Hey, Belinda, welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast. Hi, Salima. How are you? I'm great. What about you? I'm doing fantastic. That's good to hear. Well, you know, Belinda, I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Like, I'm actually pretty excited. And in addition to my excitement, I'm sincerely grateful for your willingness to tell your story. It is an honor for me to be able to draw from strength and inspiration from guests like yourself. And it's important that we take a stance together to help break barriers of mental stigma. So thank you so very much for being here to take part in what you may experience as a raw conversation. So thank you. No problem. Thank you for having me as well. Okay, so Belinda, in case that you're still wondering, this podcast is all about bringing forward untold stories that people go through, whether it's directly about a mental health struggle or something else. And one thing that we know is that no matter the story, there is impact on one's own mental health in some way, which remains tucked away. So this platform serves in a way to break the barriers of mental stigma that have been conditioned in our society. So together today, you and I, Belinda, it's my hopeful mission that you and I 
are going to be here encouraging people to share and tell what people typically have reservations for expressing. And of course, I'm bringing forward a trend and it's called the mental beauty rethink. Belinda, what comes to your mind immediately when you hear this phrase, the mental beauty rethink? When I think about that phrase, Lima, it reminds me of just being able to understand that mental beauty comes with a lot of uniqueness to it. So it can look like a lot of things. Um, Some people may call them weaknesses, but they're areas of development. Some people may call them strengths, but it's just who you are altogether that works together and and creates your own unique, beautiful mind. So that's what I, that's, I think that's what I think about when I'm looking at those words and putting them all together and just seeing a beautiful mind that has a lot of complexities of, of things that come together to create an individual, a strong individual overall that's very different from everybody else, but comes together within the community. Very interesting, beautiful mind with complexities. I mean, there is so much richness in what you shared and those words really stood out for me. You know, it's really refreshing to hear what mental beauty means to you and what strikes for you when when you hear these words. So I really appreciate hearing raw thoughts from my guests. So thank you. No problem. Yeah. So Belinda, do you have any idea of what happens next? I guess that this is the part where you... um... We get started. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's where we get this question party going and uncover your story. Are you ready? hope so. We're ready or not. Here I come. (laughs) Here you come. Well, you know what? We'll take it one step at a time. All right. Okay. So Belinda, give us the newspaper headline of how you would title your untold story. How would it read? I was to read my untold story. um, I think the headline would probably be finding my truth and returning back to Mm self-love. Finding my truth and returning to self-love. Okay. Tell me a little bit about this title. Where does it come from? It just stems from having the opportunity to, if I would describe it as looking at a mirror that's blurred instead of realizing that you have to kind of clear the mirror to really see yourself. It's hard to do that when there's a lot of noise around you. And there's a lot of things on Mm -hmm. that mirror that is said to describe who you are, which is blurring a lot of what's truly beyond that mirror so but once you're able to really take away all the the external parts of what's on the mirror maybe the the barriers of whatever is within society or the the noise and the voices that you hear that kind of drown out your inner voice and start wiping that mirror up Mm -hmm. and able to see your true self you're able to find Mm -hmm. your self-love again and, and realize who you are in the midst of all that and fully reveal who you are to yourself and moving forward, I think, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. I really like how you were able to explain that using the concept of a blurred mirror that puts a whole new perspective to it. Yeah, that's so interesting. That's really very thought provoking. So, Belinda, I want to know what your untold story is about. If you could start by sharing. Who is in your story and where it all began? That would be lovely to hear. So my story began uh, back in Africa. Uh, It definitely involves uh, my mother and and my brother as well as my immediate family. And um, in Africa, as a a Congolese woman, the society is very different. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of barriers, I can say, in terms of how women are supposed to be put forward as well as how children are supposed to be looked at as well. And it's more dominated where the males really kind of take a head of seat in terms of just the household and in society in general. So Mm -hmm. um, within those barriers, as uh, let's say using my mother, for example, as a woman, she didn't have a lot of say in terms of having a voice, despite that she Mm -hmm. was a very strong-willed woman. She was very strong, Mm -hmm. very independent, and she she definitely had her way of saying things and despite the barriers and fought through it, which is probably where Mm -hmm. I get it from. um, I also had to deal with that as well, where not only was I a woman, but I was also a child. So that's kind of double the intersectionality of that point where things were happening in my household that may not have been that great, Mm -hmm. but I felt like I was watching a movie the whole time. So 
a lot of things were happening and they were in front of me. I didn't know if I was a participant, but I knew that I couldn't say anything. I didn't have, I couldn't really reach out and say anything because I was a child, stay in a child's place stay in a woman's place. Mm. And I didn't really realize it or notice it. And that's where that kind of smoky or blurred mirror comes in. Mm. And then we moved from Africa to Canada at a very young age, around when I was nine years old, still a child Mm. kind of going through the motions of just enjoying life and going through everything. And I think a year later of, of being in Canada, I lost my brother. I didn't know at the time that it even happened. But sorry, so after you arrived to Canada, one year later you lost your brother? Yes. And you said you didn't you didn't know about it? Can you tell me? Yeah, so in the moment of it happening, I was a kid, I was kind of just looking at what was happening, but I it didn't click in my head until someone was able to actually sit down and actually really tell me what happened. So mm-hmm. I just know I went, I was there in the hospital, I was just there, you know, I knew my brother was sick for a very long time. He looked the same, but I knew my mom was holding him in her hands, but I didn't know, you know, what was the the extremes of it. Nobody really explained it to me until later on. I had someone really actually tell me, you know, what really happened a a couple, maybe a couple moments later, but um, I was still kind of in a state of, okay, this happened. Um, I had Mm -hmm. no say. I didn't know what to do. All I could do was be a woman and be a child, stay in a child's place and continue to move forward. And what was like the age difference between you and your brother? I was nine and he was five. So about four years. Okay. So he's your younger brother, four years. And so what was that like for you? Like, I know that you said that he was unwell. And did you feel, could you process and understand that you'd lost him? Were you part of that journey or that whole part of the obligations of the culture of, you know, not having a voice and staying quiet as a child. Did you get to participate in any part of it, even like before he passed or, or do you remember anything? I don't think I did. Uh, I never did at all. Okay. I was just a kid. So just going through the motions mm-hmm. and that's the where they told me to stay is where I just continued to kind of live in my little head um, moving forward. Right. And so what happened after that? Because it sounds like that's a lot of hidden pain that you tucked away. Mm -hmm. And it also sounds like even before coming to Canada, really talking about the culture that you were raised in, not really having permission to have a voice and not even really knowing that you weren't having a voice, like it was such a regular thing for you. Like this is what children do. That's what women do. Like it was kind of normalized. And then did that trend change once you came to Canada? Or do you feel like those traditions continued on or did they slowly fade? What was that like? Um, I think the trend did continue. Growing up, it was still kind of the same. We'd just be going through the motions. But I don't think from an external standpoint that changes happen. I think we still kind of followed the flow. It, It started to change for me internally when I actually started to deep a little bit more of the things that were going on. My parents' situation was very detrimental to me as well. Uh, They they didn't have the healthiest Mm -hmm. uh, relationship. So I was a witness to it. And because I was Mm -hmm. harboring a lot of things I didn't know I was harboring, even at that time when their situation escalated a little bit, I felt the emotion very strongly, but I still kept it in because I knew it wasn't my place to say anything. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say anything, couldn't Mm -hmm. really mention Mm -hmm. anything. It just kind of kept I started to now shift myself to finding outlets where I could release my pain or distract myself from the situation. And then it got a little bit worse again when my mom got cancer. So she started to get sick and she was dealing with the sickness on her own. And I didn't know how extreme it was because she didn't really mention it to me because she was such a strong woman and she did not want to hinder me in any kind of way dealing with it. At the Mm -hmm. same time, I do believe she also thought to herself, you know, you're a child, you stay in a child's place. And there were a lot of things throughout Mm -hmm. that time of her sickness that I felt like I could have said something, I could have helped, I could have maybe talked to the doctors, I could have, I could have figured something out, but I didn't. I just kind of kept quiet and Mm -hmm. let the parents do what they needed to do, especially with my parents' relationship. And just all those things combined. Sounds like a bit of guilt. Yeah. 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 
So you were aware of these things, you were harboring all of these things that you were witnessing. And then when your mom became unwell and her not letting it be known how bad it was at times, did you feel like you had awareness at the time or after the fact you were reflecting on all of these things like, oh, maybe I could have done more or maybe that was a time I I should have said something or did something or was it both? It started off, she told me, I, I got the information, but I was still like, okay, it's being dealt with from a higher level beyond me. Right. And then it got to mm. a point where when it got worse and when I realized it a, a, a year or two later how severe it was, I wondered, how come you're not going to the doctors to figure this out? Like, what's going on? And mm. I know she had her own reasons for why she was taking certain decisions and I didn't say anything. And then now looking mm. back at it, I wonder, well, why in that moment when a second stage revealed itself, why didn't she say anything? Till, till it got to the point where she was forced mm. to go to the doctors because it was getting really bad and she was getting really sick. So her body decided to, to push her there. And I, I remember sitting in the in the room while she was in the ICU. And I remember sitting there with the doctor and the doctor looked at me and said, well, how come she didn't come in earlier? We would have been able to figure this out. Like, And I looked at him and I said, I, I don't have the answer for you. When my mom is able to have strength to speak to you, she'll be able to tell you why she didn't do what she did. I can't tell you. I don't know. I'm as shocked as you are. And if I knew this information. What was that like for you, for the doctor to ask you that question? What was that experience like for you? Did you feel like you were being questioned? It was, I don't know how I felt. I just, I know at that time and during that, that moment and being there that weekend, I just felt like the world flipped upside down. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. anything else that was happening, I, it just felt like a blur and when he asked me, I, I, I think we both looked at each other confused, as both confused because I guess he had all the answers and I didn't have any answers. So it was just two people, one with a lot of information, and another one with no information and just looking at each other and wondering why we didn't maybe figure things out. There's a power differential there too, right? Yeah. Right. And I guess you're hit with the reality of what was going on with your mom. Because she did such a great job of hiding it or having certain decisions that you were respecting, but not knowing the full extent of what she was harboring within her mm-hmm. as well. It seems like it was all coming out in the surface for the things you were witnessing at the hospital. Yeah. That must have been really tough to digest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then what else happened? What happened after that? After that, she got well and she was able to come back home and I was off to university. Uh, So Mm -hmm. they did tell her she had a limited amount of time in terms of her lifespan, but she was fighting through it and she was progressing very well. Mm -hmm. And in those moments, you know, I saw a very strong woman moving forward and and doing the best that she could. And and I was just making sure that as I went to university, I, I did feel a little bit guilty for for leaving her, um, but she was very strong, mm-hmm. and she would. She told me, "I'm. I'll be strong for you. You go in, and make sure that you get your academics and pursue your goals." And I, at that time, got a a varsity scholarship at my school, so she really wanted me to mm-hmm. take an opportunity to to explore that and and do the best that I could. And my goal was always to come back after the years I was finished and just be able to take care of her after that and and after getting my degree and figuring out life for the both of us that was always my goal despite um dealing with someone that is sick she did have her moments of mm-hmm. of of you know being a little bit challenging um which I don't blame her for I'm also a kid and her child so I know that at the time I was also very difficult to deal with as well but I just felt like though in in those moments still it was still a a moment where I, I, she wanted to deal with it on her own. She didn't want help. Mm -hmm. She didn't want support. She just wanted me to focus on being a child. And I didn't think that was a good idea, but I just kind of went with the flow of it. And well, you were respecting her boundaries and her decisions and her choices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, she had to make choices that were good for her. Or what, yeah. what she believed was good for her, right? And I'm sure she was always thinking about her decisions in, in correspondence to what would be good for you too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. 
So what else did you witness with your mom? So I think the breaking point now for me, Mm -hmm. she got to a point where she was very distant from a lot of people. And I think that should have been Mm -hmm. my sign in the moment to realize something's coming up. But I just thought she probably Mm -hmm. just needed her space. So I just remember Mm -hmm. going into my fifth year. It was my last year. And um, they're like, okay, well, things are getting pretty heavy at home. And the situation is heated. But at this point where I'm going to finish school to the best that I can. And then I'll come back and figure it out. And I remember it was on a Friday where I got a call that she passed. Oh, my goodness. So you weren't there at the time? No, uh, I wasn't there at the time. Mm-hmm. I wasn't there at the time. I just got a call. And so I had to rush back home in my fifth year, of, like the first mm-hmm. semester, to figure everything out. And I guess the guilt of not being there yeah. was hard and not saying goodbye. And then you had so many things to figure out. Did you have support or did you have to do those things on your own? Um, I think I had I had support of my friends and family, but a lot of the things that I had mm-hmm. to do in terms of her estate and in terms of just carrying on, I had to do on my own. Mm-hmm. I did have family and friends that, that were there. And, mm-hmm. But uh, after her passing, I think at that point, I felt like my heart cocked open. And a lot of the things that I went through, because even in, throughout my life, I also noticed just in terms of how she dealt with her relationships, I did as well. So I know from the point of her her passing a couple months later, I also was dealing with heartbreak. So my heart just kept cracking open to the point where I couldn't keep everything in anymore. I had to start to, mm-hmm. I had to start to scream or I had to just start talking. And sometimes mm-hmm. it was a little bit more aggressive. Sometimes it was loud. Sometimes I just felt like I couldn't take it anymore. Like I have mm-hmm. to start to say something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You were holding on to something that wasn't working anymore and you needed to do something different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was that journey like for you? It was tough because I was grieving a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. And Mm-hmm. I'm not good with mm-hmm. emotions in general. So mm-hmm. I felt the pain and then I was mad at myself for feeling the pain. I suffered a lot of anxiety, heightened anxiety, because I would be crying excessively and I'd be scared of how much I was crying because I've never cried like that before in my life. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I would start to have like some a little bit of some panics in terms of my anxiety. My friends and family were there and supportive, but in the moments I wasn't myself so they could tell and just made sure I was kept in check and made sure that um, despite how bad it could be, just try to do your best to heal, try to do your best to just to figure it Mm -hmm. out. Otherwise, you know, you don't want to lose more than, than what you've already lost in terms of that, because it's, it started to get to a point where I really started to say, you know what, enough is enough Mm -hmm. because I let a lot of things in my life slide. I let a lot of things just kind of, go through just because in terms of how I was raised you I would have to stay in my own place Mm -hmm. would you say that you were learning to walk away from things that weren't serving a purpose for you anymore like you could see those things more clearly Mm -hmm. and have awareness and then make different choices yeah um definitely Mm -hmm. I I think the heartbreak side made me realize I was following my mom's patterns Mm -hmm. and the moment I couldn't let go but then I realized Mm -hmm. My mom wasn't someone who could let go either. She would hold on really, really hard. And I told myself, if you keep holding on, it'll be the same thing. Sometimes you're not supposed to be obligated to stay in certain circumstances just Mm -hmm. because society or culture or religion Mm -hmm. or anything tells you to do so. Mm -hmm. If it's hurting you, Mm -hmm. it's okay to let it go. Right. So permission, you're really giving yourself permission to do it differently. Yeah. So I, I started to let go. I, I had certain people around me as well where they had a certain dominance to them that because I was someone that allowed them to kind of treat me a certain kind of way, that's the reason mm-hmm. why our relationship continued. And sometimes for mm-hmm. so long. And when I started to stand up for myself, I started to realize how much resistance there was 
in terms of our relationship that I wondered how come when I'm trying to tell you, hey, this is hurting me or I don't like this or I'm voicing my opinion, you're now becoming very rigid towards me. And that's when I realized that I didn't speak for so long that I enabled this. And I, I now that I'm actually sticking up for myself, this is not healthy. So I started to just let go of a lot of things. So when you were letting go of things, would you say that you were actually reconnecting with your voice? Yeah, because even to hear and to see myself kind of look and say, you know what, I don't have to say it as aggressive. I, I learned to shift out of saying things out of aggression and pain and just looking at the circumstance and looking at the person and saying, you know what, this is not working for me. And mm. just to hear myself utter those words, because I think I was so scared to lose people as well. And as a part of my attachment style and what I've learned from the dynamic of the primary relationship I saw, I was so worried about that because for me, the end goal was the person. But then I realized I'm losing myself just trying to hold on to the person. And then when I lost right. the person, I felt my vocal cords felt shaky, but stronger. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the, the process of your transformation is that the vocal cords got shaky, but there was also like a release. The release helped you sort of move forward. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah, it sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. And so the theme of your voice emerged. You learned to speak up. What was that process like, the process where you were still wavering in and out? So, you know, you knew you had to speak up and then you would worry about speaking up and then you worried about the consequences of speaking up and planted some pictures of what would life be like if you spoke up. Did you ever imagine what life would be like in a positive way if you spoke up? At the time that it was happening, no, I, I didn't see a positive to it. I just saw a reaction from the other person. I saw a reactive mm, circumstance. Mm -hmm. it, it would become a challenge. But then, you know, the more I did it, the more I realized how important it was for myself. And I still do struggle with it now sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do find myself when I am going through those patterns, I think I get to a point where I tell myself enough is enough. You can't keep doing this. I understand you're trying to cater to the other person, but mm -hmm. you can't break yourself apart by keeping quiet because communication is, is also important because maybe the other person mm -hmm. doesn't know, especially in newer relationships. Now it's, it's important to communicate because maybe the other person doesn't know. And the only way they can know and learn is through me communicating and I, I did over the years have such a distant way of communicating. So I, whenever I felt certain things or whenever I, I wanted to speak up about any injustices that I saw for myself or for anybody else, I kept it to myself because I didn't want to cause a ruckus in, around in the, in the environment. But mm -hmm. I started to learn that, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes conflict is good when it's for a good thing. Sometimes it, it right. is good to kind of shake the room a little bit. It's healthy. Yeah, it's going to bring a healthy outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's probably other people in the room probably thinking the same thing and they can't speak. And if one person is able to have that opportunity, maybe mm -hmm. other people that can't find their voice can too, is what I started to learn. Absolutely. Yes, you lead by example when you start speaking and allowing yourself to do it confidently and not worrying about who thinks what. And that you're doing it for yourself, not for anyone else. Other people see the strength in that too. You become the example that people aspire to, to become as well. I'm so intrigued about what path you ended up charting in your mental health journey when you were met with grief and losing your mom and mourning all of what you've had to go through. It seems like that blurred mirror started to make progress, even though you lost something so great. Yeah, it was, um, it was interesting how much of myself I could see in both mm -hmm. the good light, and I wouldn't say it's the bad light. I think it's the development light because 
even in the moments of, of realization, I thought, wow, look at how powerful you could be just by realizing that, you know, you've hindered yourself a lot because of what a lot of your external environment has told you to be and told you to do and told you how to act. Look at how much you can stand strong for yourself when you feel like something's wrong, even in the littlest form and try to figure out how to make it right for yourself and those around you if it's needed as well. Yeah. So I'm a little curious. When people come to see me for therapy, individuals are typically in one of three places. Some people are getting started. Some people are in the middle and some people are looking back. When some people are getting started, you know, they're just coming to me and they've got all these things that are going on and they need to start working somewhere. Sometimes they don't even know where to begin and they need guidance there. Some people are acutely in the thick of a particular mess or chaos and they need support with navigating through that. And then there's some people who come that are looking back. It's like they might be looking for closure on something or they're looking to make sense or make peace with something so they can move forward or move on to the next chapter in their life. Where would you say you are in the journey? Would you say that you're getting started in the middle, looking back? I think I could say I'm getting started and in the middle. Mm -hmm. I'd say that because there's still, I think, some moments where there's things I do need to clear out and there was things still even in this current year that I needed to clear out. So I was getting started with certain relationships ending and realizing Mm -hmm. you love this person, of course, unconditionally. And Mm -hmm. it's going to be hard, but patterns can't continue. It's not Mm -hmm. healthy if it's a negative pattern and you can't keep going through it over and over and you need to find peace. So that is something that I'm still kind of going through, especially moving into a new phase and being a different person now that's not so dismissive and is more emotional. Sometimes I still am shocked and can't deal with certain things. And sometimes I feel like, oh, wow, I thought I, you know, overcame this. So I'm still, I'm still getting started, Mm -hmm. but I do feel like I'm in the middle as well. Yeah. You're recognizing, oh, there's more work to be done here. Oh, I thought I could work through that. I guess there's more, there's deeper layers. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The bigger emotions are buried deeper. So the more you're able to delayer, the more you're able to tap into some of the core feelings and the core experiences. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're on a great journey though. Yeah. It's been a full journey, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I know that you've talked a little bit about how when your mom passed and you had support, but you also knew that you weren't really yourself. You weren't able to contain all of the emotions and the guilt and the crying and the bouts of panic and different things that were going on. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how your untold story, how this affected your mental health? Can you share a little bit more about these impacts? I think I I struggled with just dealing with the anxiety in my head. And then I also struggled with okay, well, we told ourselves, you know, a world without your mom is not possible. So then when it happened, it was like, okay, my mom's not here. So in those depressive modes, I was like, does this world need to exist anymore? And Mm -hmm. kind of struggled back and forth with, you know, that was my anchor. Mm -hmm. If the whole world was crashing, that's where the person I would go to. And now there Mm -hmm. was no one really to go to. I could understand me from from a very deeper level. So it was a lot of my mental state. I think that's where a lot of the reactions of how I was dealing with my grief came from. And my family and friends were understanding of it because they 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 knew me and they knew me before. So they knew that this was different, a different person in front of them. And a lot of them knew mm-hmm. my mom as well, um, knew who she was to mm-hmm. me as well and how important she was. So they they understood. But it took a lot for me to go through that and dive into truly understanding where to go next. Okay. Yeah. And so when you were stuck in these places of thinking about this world without your mom and it not being possible and that she's not here anymore, 
and your go-to person is, is not around in the same way. How did you cope with that? Did the thoughts come over you? Like, did you have competing thoughts in your mind? What was it like? I knew I had to to get up and fight for myself in terms of having to deal with everything. So being able to try to figure out the next steps is what distracted me. And even though it kind of broke me down at times going through a lot of our things and stuff, I knew I had to get it done because that's just the toughness I built, Mm -hmm. especially coming from, she was the same way as, you know, going through a lot of emotional pain. She fought her way through it every time and she had to always look Mm -hmm. strong. And I got those genes of always having to always look strong no matter what. So I think even in some cases, a lot of my family and friends couldn't tell if I was going through Mm -hmm. anything because I was very good at hiding it. Even now, I'm very good at hiding it. But Mm -hmm. those were distracting ways. But I I, I know I did a lot of other things to help me cope as well. Were there any dark thoughts that came along? It didn't get that dark, but it. Mm -hmm. I thought more being at peace to transition though. Because I knew, you know, if something was to happen to me, there's someone I'm looking forward to on the other side. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's me making peace with death or. Well, like you were still caring for life, right? I think I was doing it because I knew I had to. You knew you had to. I I couldn't look weak, but I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So those are probably some of the competing thoughts you had in your mind, right? Like, I can't look weak. I have to fight. But do I ever long to be with my mom? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it would be like to go through that kind of pain. You know, you've been able to share with such vulnerability how your mental health has been impacted. I really appreciate this level of vulnerability and what you've shared. and to what extent you've you've been sharing. Belinda, can you share with me, what is your key message to the listeners of our show? What do you want them to know? I think what I'd want them to know for sure is it's okay to show emotions. It's okay to have feelings for sure. I think that's something I've learned. Another thing is it's also okay to communicate and acknowledge your own voice and speak up for yourself when something doesn't feel right Mm -hmm. for yourself and even for the people around you, even if they are making choices, at least you communicated to them how you felt Mm -hmm. and they're able to to acknowledge it. And maybe, you know, if it is something positive that they can look at later on and say, hey, maybe, you know, she's right. We can try this approach. It'll help. And moving forward, and I think the biggest thing I would love for the viewers to know is as hard as things may be, um, being able to get into a state of trying to ease your mental health and find the strength to understand your emotions. In the past, it was not as important, but it is important. And it's as important as coming into an opportunity and, and fighting for your life or and fighting and striving mm-hmm. and succeeding. It, it's it's as important. You, you need that emotional strength to be able to continue to push through. And I I believe Mm. once I was able to utilize both, I was able to to understand how to cope and whoever else is listening should know that it's okay to feel and it's okay to fight Mm. and put them both together. It's okay to feel and it's okay to fight. That's a lot of inspirational wisdom right there. Thank you. So I'm curious, what would be that game-changing inspiration that's close to you? That would reflect your untold story. Were you inspired by a quote or a book or a person, a speaker, an event, a place? Anything come to mind? Even in the journey of finding my voice, I started to read a lot. And I think the more knowledge I gained, the more I wanted to speak. Um, So Mm -hmm. a book that definitely resonates from the first time I read it till this day is called Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. And it's... Mm -hmm our deepest fear quote, how I found it was I was watching um, Coach Carter one day and I saw Mm -hmm. one of the players recited in the movie and I thought, you know, I wonder who 
said that quote and I went, researched it, found her name and I realized, oh, it's in a book that she Mm -hmm. published. So I went to find the Mm -hmm. book and then I started to read it and I actually memorized the quote. She says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness that most frightens us. And your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine as Mm -hmm. children do. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people the permission to do the same. And as we liberate ourselves, we liberate others. And I thought that was really powerful. So I I memorized it and and I kept it with me Mm -hmm. everywhere I went to just remind myself that it is scary to, to communicate. It's scary, but Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a it's powerful so take that step yes yes it's powerful it's beautiful I've heard it many times I've read the book we've used some of her work in therapy with clients and it's it's a great book and uh, a lot of great reads in her book for sure that's wonderful that you were able to connect with that and memorize it and you know just keep it so close to you so what would be a cause or an organization that has been impactful to you on your journey that you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah. So during my time of my education and getting my master's degree, I was able to do a social justice practicum. Um, This is where we Mm -hmm. were able to find a nonprofit organization that is serving a marginalized population in terms of just advocating for the community. And I I got the chance to collaborate and get my hours with Hey Black Girl. Um, It's an organization in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Ontario is fairly new. And they support Mm -hmm. uh, Black women in terms of entrepreneurship and support through workshops. Nice. And then from that point, I also got the opportunity to get in contact with another organization. Um, They're located in BC, but they're all around supportive Mm -hmm. throughout Canada. They're called Odihi. They do similar things as Hey Black Mm -hmm. Girl in terms of just supporting Black women. And they provide a lot of mentorship Mm -hmm. as well. And they collaborate with Mm -hmm. a lot of organizations within the community to support. So I, I think in finding my own voice and reaching forward and seeing how we can support the community is probably one of the next steps for me in terms of my growth. And it's exciting to collaborate with them as well. Yeah, amazing. That sounds so wonderful that we have organizations and nonprofits emerging like the ones that you've mentioned. That's great. Hey, Black Girl and Odihi. That's so great. Yeah. All right. So, Belinda, how can people connect with you if they would like to? What platforms are you on? So I am on LinkedIn and I'm Mm -hmm. also on Instagram as well. Perfect. Okay. We'll make sure we get those from you so that it could be part of your show notes page. Wonderful. So Belinda, guess what? What is it? (laughs) You've just dared yourself to share. Congratulations. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) You just did it. How was this experience for you? A lot of things. I think another way of of pushing myself to finding my own voice and, you know, feeling the scary moments, feeling the barriers, feeling the external thoughts and just telling myself, you know what, you got to do it because it's it's a part of the journey. So we're leaving now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It does sound like it's been relieving. And Belinda, for me, I am sitting here as a witness to your story, a difficult journey that you have been on, and you were relentless in your expression today. I mean, sharing some extremely touching moments of your life. I mean, you shared how you saw your mother work through her marriage and not give up on herself. You shared about how you saw your mother through your brother's illness from the young age and not give up. You saw your mother mourn for the loss of her son at age five. You also witnessed and saw your mother battle cancer and keep fighting until the end. I hope that you are exceptionally proud of yourself for the steps that you've taken and that you celebrate every day who you are and where you came from. Your story is so inspirational and I'm certain that it will spark hope for others who are seeking it, both knowingly and unknowingly. So I really want to thank you for the deep conversation and for all the daring and for all the sharing. Thank you so much, Salima, for having me. It's been my pleasure. And once again, Belinda, thank you for being part of Dare to Share, your untold story, and helping to be a voice in breaking down the barriers of mental stigma. (laughs) 
to all of our listeners. If you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and you want to be part of breaking down barriers of mental stigma, I invite you to go wherever you are listening to the episode and hit subscribe. Leave us a comment or a review of the episode and maybe how you relate to it. To learn more about what we offer, visit www.daretoheal.co and if you are feeling ready and brave to share, please submit your story by visiting www.daretoshare.co. Thanks for joining in.